So here's what we're going to be going over today. I'm just going to do a really quick overview of what Farm to School is, and then I'm going to pass to Cecilia to share some um, best practices and some more gardening tips, and then she's going to introduce our three guest speakers who are going to share their expertise. And as I said before, we'll open it up for questions and some discussion after you've heard from everyone. And like I said, feel free to add your questions to the chat as we go. So um, Farm to School, I'm sure a lot of you already who are already here know what Farm to School is, but just wanted to give a brief overview um, of the three pillars of Farm to School. So we have the school gardening, um, you know, food education, and local procurement, which is often happening in the cafeteria. So obviously today we're focused most on school gardens, and as you can imagine, that's just involving students in the planning, planting, tending, and harvesting of fruits and vegetables and other crops at schools. Um, so this might look like raised garden beds out in your classroom um, yard or maybe pots and window um, in a classroom window still. So there's a lot of um, ways to garden at school um, that don't just have to look like a traditional garden. And then those other two pillars are happening, I think, I think education happens throughout all of the pillars, and that's how you kind of see farm to school comes together in the middle. Um, so education can be related to food, agriculture, nutrition, and gardening, cooking, and basically just giving um, students educational opportunities that help develop important skills. And then lastly, we have local procurement, which is providing students with access to locally grown foods by procuring those from farmers or even um, serving produce from the garden in a taste test or a snack um, or your lunch at school. And we really like to say that Farm to School is a triple win because it emphasizes experiential learning opportunities, it allows for parent and community engagement, and it can support lifelong health and wellness for children. Um, in particular, health is obvious. It's obvious that kids are going to have the opportunity to eat fresh fruits and vegetables and help them that help them nourish at a really critical time in their life stage. And then for agriculture, schools that are buying local are helping support our small and medium farms in our area. And then that kind of has effects into the economy um, as you're supporting your local farmers, it's boosting your economy. And then also we say that farm to school is great for community because it's able to build relationships that foster a sense of community where neighbors are supporting each other in their local school. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Cecilia now. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, so to start our presentations, I'm going to give an overview of some, of some tips and best practices about summer gardening, and you'll hear more in-depth um, information about these tips and practices from our speakers later. Um, but first, I want to start with volunteer and youth programs are great tools to recruit extra help throughout the summer. Volunteers can be family or community members who want to stay involved with the garden throughout the summer. You can create a garden committee or do an adopt the garden program for students in the community. Um, if your school does have youth summer programs, try incorporating their time in the school garden. This is really great breaks for um, any program, but especially science camps. And East students also make great helpers in the garden as well. In addition to gathering community support, you can try to limit the amount of maintenance needed in a summer school garden. So mulching a garden can protect it from weeds growing and keep the soil covered. You can also plant a summer cover crop like millet, sorghum, or buckwheat to add organic matter to your soil and then later use the stems or shoots as mulch when you're getting ready to plant. Irrigation systems are also a great option to automate or alleviate your watering duties throughout the summer. So you can find a lot of equipment for these at home improvement stores um, locally in your community. And lastly, you can plan your harvest around the summer. So you can plant in late summer so that students can harvest plants when they come back in the fall, or you can plant and have students who care for the summer garden harvest and take home what they find in the garden throughout the summer, which is also a really fun way for students to visit. Um, and with that, I'm gonna move on to our first speaker, which is, Jennifer Bogart. Um, and so I'm excited to introduce her. She's an educator at John Tyson Elementary in Springdale, Arkansas. And today she is going to be talking about how you can rely on community support and volunteers to maintain their garden in the summer. So I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you today and to share some simple tips for 
um, stewarding your garden during the summer. As Cecilia said, I am the East Facilitator at John Tyson Elementary School in Springdale. If you are unfamiliar with East, it is a um, community service and technology class that allows students to use technology to make an improvement or solve a problem in their community. And so the story of the school garden at John Tyson Elementary School started with this problem. And um, this story is incredible because a parent noticed that a, we, we did kind of have an existing school garden that looked a little bit um, rundown, I'll just say. And so the parent saw a grant, suggested that our EAST program apply for that grant. And then as we were out cleaning out the old beds and, and preparing for the installation of the new garden after we received that grant, um, a community member walked by and saw the students working in the garden and um, made a couple of donations to our garden. So that's kind of how the garden got started. And we've kept that simple um, community relationship model throughout the uh, couple of years that we have had our new school garden at Tyson Elementary. Um, I, I would like to say that we use the word steward because that definition um, of the word steward means to look after or manage another's property for a little bit of time. And so when the family sign up to steward the garden, they realize that they're doing it for just a little bit of time and then they pass it on to someone else. And it doesn't seem like an overwhelming summer long task that they have to do. So the three S's of summer garden stewardship are show, specific, and say. So I use that alliteration, but you could say any words there. You could say promote, tell directions, and communicate with your family, express gratitude, however you want to uh, think about those um, three categories. But I, I've chosen the, the three S's, and it really should have said four S's because I want you to keep your um, summer garden maintenance simple too. So first we'll talk about show. And we use social media. If you'll go on to that next slide, please, Cecilia. Thanks. We use a lot of social media to promote our school garden. And we use that social media to show family and friends and staff and community members what's happening in the garden. We do that to create a buzz, to get them involved, to um, make them uh, excited and we use the social media throughout the year and show all the different stages of the garden you know what's happening in the fall and what's happening in the summer and when the kids are planning things in the spring or the fall um, we have them make videos to tell what's growing on get it what's going on in the garden we use what's growing on as a little you know just fun thing um, we build that student hype by involving lots of students, students from different age levels, ethnicities, uh, levels of parental involvement. We have um, single moms and university professors who help with our school garden, and they have all become involved with the school garden because of the student hype in the social media that we have used. They... Um, you know, our kids kind of think about our school garden like Santa Claus. And those of you who have been around children at Christmas time who are excited about Santa Claus know that they say, Santa Claus is coming in three days. I can't wait for Santa Claus, Santa Claus. And that's kind of how our kids talk about our school garden. They can't wait to work in the garden. They can't wait to harvest. They can't wait to make a video for social media or the school assembly to tell what's growing on. And so, as, as parents know, when your kids are excited about something, you become excited about it too. We do a little bit of strategic gardening during the year. So while the parents are lined up for the car rider line, I have the kids working in the garden so the parents can see their children out there working. We send produce home with the students. And I got an email from a, a parent recently that said, um, the garden is an incredible project. 
uh, the girls were so excited to explain all the plants to us. It's just the coolest. And I'll have you know that they took the radishes that they harvested home and made radish pasta soup, which I thought sounded a little bit disgusting and I couldn't wait to hear how they enjoyed it. And the mom confirmed that it was indeed disgusting. But I loved that the kids tried a new um, vegetable and they experimented with cooking and that just built the relationship with that family and our school garden and me a little bit more. Share the story. So later on, I'm sure you'll have access to these uh, videos and slides, but this is the story of a project that occurred in our school garden. When we installed the garden, the, um, uh, some third grade girls said, we noticed our friend in the wheelchair um, can't ever participate in our gardening activities at school. And frankly, they were distraught. And so we talked through some things that they could do in order to help their friend participate in our school garden. They wrote a grant for donors choose and, and got an elevated bed and some grow bags and took her out to the garden. And um, she was able to work in the garden and the smile that you'll see in this video will melt your heart. So then the girls thought, you know, lots of kids are really anxious and sad and upset as a result of COVID and, and the world that we live in. And so they wanted to install a sensory bed. So they spent this past year researching and writing grants and, and planning um, a sensory garden bed and they have installed that now. Well, so what about parents? They're listening to their kids who are on fire and excited about these projects and they're using the garden for good. And so guess what those parents want to do? They want to keep that garden alive because their little kids are so passionate about what's happening in it. And the parents see the good that is coming from the school garden. Um, next, the thing that I would say to you is be specific. So in order to um, get volunteers, I use a tool called Sign Up Genius. Will you go on? Yeah, thanks. And how about one more? Thank you so much. I use a tool called Sign Up Genius. And if you wouldn't mind to click on that link just so the um, participants today can see what that looks like. So with the Sign Up Genius, this is an online tool that allows families to select a week during the summer that they would like to sign up to steward the garden. I, um, I have a little blurb on here that says, if you want your family to have an educational, engaging, exciting experience this summer, you know, water, weed, and harvest. And I just make it super simple. After they sign up, I follow up with an email and some simple instructions. I uh, post the Sign Up Genius on social media. Once again, I'm talking about social media. I send a direct email to families and I ask them to send me a picture of their family working in the garden. And I do this for a two-fold purpose. Number one, just to make sure that the garden is um, stewarded that week, that it's been watered, but also so that I can thank them. I post that picture on social media, give a shout out to the family for their time, energy, and assistance. And I'll just tell you, I've been to the garden one time this summer, and our garden looks incredible right now. The only reason I went to the garden was because I was at school for another purpose, and I just popped by to peek at it. So this has really um, fr freed me up. I'm not up there working in the garden all summer long. The families are taking care of the garden. If you ask them, they will help. Finally, say, say thank you. Thank them privately. Thank them publicly. Express your gratitude. And we all know if someone gives us a pat on the back that we are more likely to help a little bit more. So I would just say that expressing gratitude is almost as important as that social media presence that you're uh, doing and creating that buzz and hype about your school garden all summer and all school year long. So say thank you and um, just really express your gratitude for their assistance. I make my number available if the families need to text me or talk to me 
and if there are any issues in the garden. And, you know, sometimes I do get a, the locks broken on this or we can't get the water key to work, but it, it really is a simple and effective way that we have um, created our model for summer garden maintenance. So I'll say to you, if you are interested in learning what radish pasta soup looks like, or if you would like to see our summer garden and follow along um, with whoever is working in our garden this summer, or if you would like to spend the year finding out what's growing on, then please follow the JTE Learning Garden and find out what's growing on. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I really love the radish soup and the kids taking initiative and getting parents excited. That's really, I think, what School Gardens is all about with getting students to explore. Um, and I really think it's awesome that you have the Learning Garden page as well so students and parents can constantly engage. So thank you. If you have any questions for Jennifer as well, be sure to put them in the chat. And then I'm going to move on to our next speaker, which is Blanca Hernandez. She is a um, county extension agent for the University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service. And today she's going to be talking to us about what resources extension offers that can support school gardening efforts. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Blanca. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I did, I do have a lot of um, ideas from Jennifer because I also work with uh, some gardens and I'm probably going to contact you, Jennifer, for more questions about it. Uh, but I'm going to cover um, uh, extension, uh, corporate extension part and more in the, what agents and can uh, resources can available for you. Um, when you start um, a school garden or how to, everything that we can provide to, um, to you. Um, some of the resources, you know, like uh, every information that we provide, it will be research-based information. So I got in here and the, the website for the university website and it has a tons of information. And I know sometimes, you know, like, it can be overwhelmed, but but if you look into the website, um, and like I say, is is um, if you want to start a garden, if you um, need um, things, but if you are not into the online things because it's an old-fashioned way that you want, you can contact the agents, and that's what I am here, and I'm in Pulaski County. But every every um, county has an um, uh, agent and you can call our office and uh, we can, if we don't know the answer, we can for sure uh, find out uh, and help you in any way that we can. And we have the agricultural and I'll go over each one of them later. And we have the family consumer science and nutrition and that's what I am, but also garden is related with nutrition. So we have, um, garden is part of our curriculum. Then we have the 4 H, and I will talk to you what ideas about uh, 4 Hers that you can create clubs on, on that. And then we have the com community developing agents. Uh, we also have the Department of Food Sciences. If for any reason you have questions about that with the food, the preparations, the pH, the things, we have a department that can answer all your questions. And did I say that all the information that we have is free? So we love free stuff. So everything that the university provide for two things that are very important, research-based information. And then the second that is free. So really take advantage of all the information that we can provide to you, to anybody that it needs. Uh, and um, of course, the university is based in Arkansas. If you are out of state, you know, you might have uh, your uh, extensions and your state that you are, but, but um, some might be, you know, like you can be used, but, um, um, but we kind of go in Arkansas. Um, the, the, the agents that if you are um, looking for agriculture, I think if you start, your, you know, you start going to start your, your garden. 
things that you can do. And I will go over my experience with uh, starting um, a garden in a school, a school garden, a soil test sample. So if you need to do your, uh, your soil test, it's free, like I said before. Just bring it to the county agents and uh, just bring a sample. And then we will do that for you before you start your garden. Um, we have, if you have, a, if you're already planting and you have a questions about, you know, your tomatoes, tomatoes are not doing good, you can send a pictures or you can bring a piece of uh, how the tomato looks like and um, the agent uh, can help you to figure out what to do, what is the disease and all that. Th that's information that's a very good information when you start and you really don't know anything about uh, the plants. Um, if you have anything in the garden that is going wrong, we might be able to help you to find that, figure out what to do. Um, if you, before you start, you can, they can suggest you what to do step by step. And I'm going to go over my experience or what I did when I started the garden. Um, next slide, please. So for me, I start um, elementary school uh, as a family consumer science. Um, I have a, um, a school that I'm working with and uh, for the nutrition side. So talking to them, it, it was a pick a better snack. So, so I was giving them uh, snacks to the school and the kids. And I, I noticed that when I started with them, they really didn't, um, they didn't get, you know, the teacher were not really engaged with the, with the curriculum and everything, even though, you know, I provide them and I talk to about nutrition and all that. So I mentioned to them that what well, could be a good idea to create a garden in here in the school. And they said, well, you know, we have a garden in the back that, it, it, that the city already built and you can go and look at it. And that's, those pictures are how I found it. Uh, it was a mess in the school, really uh, totally, we didn't know what was in there. So what I did, I got the, the ag agent uh, in the here and he came with me and he gave me, you know, every, step by step, everything that I needed to to start the garden, you know, to start cleaning. And we did this, this uh, soil test first, and then we amend the soil. He gave me all the information that I need after I received the, the test back. Uh, and we start cleaning. And, and when I start, you know, this is uh, things that, uh, how it looks after we clean it, we find out that it has like 30, uh, blueberries plants in the garden that we didn't know that was there. Um, um, unfortunately, we couldn't save them, but they were gone already. So when uh, we got clean and we got, um, I have like you, like Jennifer was mentioning, volunteers. Uh, we got volunteers from the community. The community uh, use a, a, a path around the school and the community were coming and see how we were cleaning the, the garden. And they start asking questions. Why, oh, this is great. And we want to volunteers. And so I start getting the, their names and their numbers. And now they really are helping me to put the tarp. I have uh, one of the things that I, uh, uh, I have a Master Gardeners volunteers that came and helped me. I also um, have um, one of the Master Gardeners volunteers uh, help me to get some grants and uh, so buy, I uh, have a compost in order that with the money that they gave me and they help me pay for the, the, the liner so we look clean. Um, and the most important thing is uh, all this, uh, when I started, I, you know, like I said, the teachers were kind of not engaged. As soon as I start getting the garden, I took one day before they left there for the school in May, I planted, um, I, I was looking, what can it grow fast in winter, kind of in spring with the cold temperature so that it could engage the teachers and the kids. So I plant a snap piece and by the, when this, before the school was out, 
the kids came to the garden, the teachers came to the gardens. Oh my God, the teachers were so excited after. So I got them engaged. So this is a new project. I just started in with the garden in February, really. Uh, so we, um, I think I got the, the teachers now buy-in for the next school year. Uh, unfortunately, the school do not um, have anything going on in summer, but, because the community was coming through, you know, and, and the volunteers, I have the community involved and they are really in summer being very supportive. So they are been helping me to get, uh, because I got now uh, gravel in there. And, and they, what I did was three of the beds, um, I say for the kids, because I want the kids to see something, you know, like a, uh, um, when they come back from school, after school, there's something to pick, to harvest. Um, so I got sweet potato, one bed, whole bed, and two um, watermelon. So I hope, and it's the community is helping me maintain now the, 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 the beds. And they help me uh, get in the gravel. And in another part, um, they painting some, some chairs and, and uh, they've been now asking me what else we can do and all that. And they are maintaining two of the big beds for them in the summertime. So eventually I hope for the next year, I'll get all the ideas that Jennifer has and I'll get that more, more them uh, involved in the garden. And and doing more stuff for this for in summertime, uh, but it's looking a lot better. Uh, and uh, and other things that we help, um, we could help is um, there is a lot of uh, we receive uh, sometimes information about um, grants. You know the Farm Bureau has a lot of grants, and we can pass that information to to schools to to anybody that could use it and get all those grants. Uh, so the garden is at uh, this point um, ready for this kid, the kids when they come back. We still have some little things to do. Um, we getting a compost so the kids learn all, all that. So it will be ready when the kids come back from school. I think um, that was the last pictures and we can get some questions. Yeah, thank you, Blanca. Again, if you have any questions, just be sure to send them in the chat. And after our last presentation, we will kind of come back to them and have a conversation about everything we've learned today. But our next speaker is going to be Bernie Kurz, and he is also with the Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service and has extensive gardening expertise. And so we're lucky to have him share about our best practices for low maintenance summer garden, gardening. Um, also feel really lucky because Bernie shared with us, he is about to retire at the end of this month and move to, or are you in Fayetteville or are you moving to Fayetteville? Um, but he will be based in Fayetteville. So I will pass it over to Bernie. Thank you very much. Uh, boy, I'm very impressed uh, with what uh, has gone on at the John Tyson Ele Elementary School. Kudos to, to uh, Jennifer there. And Blanca, I'm amazed. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, what you have done with uh, the Williams Magnet School. Fantastic. So uh, I think uh, what I'm going to share may, may expand on some things that have been shared already, but let's go with the presentation. You know, does your school garden look like this? You know, uh, Blanca showed what hers looked like and, and uh, many garden school gardens I have seen look like this. Uh, by the time August rolls around, uh, everyone has left for the summer. Uh, but again, I like what Jennifer at John Tyson has done, uh, uh, particularly with the the, the uh, sign up genius that she uses to to get folks continued involved throughout the summer. So let's, next slide. I think someone is on here from the Delta School. They've done a fantastic job. I, I went to Delta School uh, Garden uh, about three summers ago, 
And I'm, I'm totally impressed with what they've done at, at Wilson there uh, at the Delta School, that engagement they have with the kids and, and certainly the families. But again, it's great to hear uh, some, some of the examples that we, we heard earlier today too. Next. So summer maintenance. Uh, you know, you've got to have a plan before you plant. Uh, and certainly uh, Jennifer and uh, John Tyson has, has a great plan in place. And, and that, that plan can be modified with most every school garden. Uh, again, kudos, thanks to Jennifer for uh, sharing that, that with us. Uh, there are a lot of folks in the community that want your garden to be successful, but finding those people is the key. So you have to reach out. Uh, and, and, and be supportive to those volunteers, as Jennifer has said, thank them, thank them over and over again, certainly privately and publicly as, as she stressed. Uh, summer months are killers. Uh, you know, we, we have the 100 degree plus weather right now. Uh, who wants to garden this in this heat and this humidity? Uh, but volunteers, once, once you, once they see the vision, once they can see the results uh, of a good plan in place, they will be there even if it's six o'clock in the morning to go to the garden to maintain it, they will be there. Next. So uh, let's talk about some of the basics. Uh, early we, we heard about uh, one of the key things for maintaining summer garden is watering, and certainly that's it. Uh, basically, uh, in-ground gardens require about an inch of water per week. Now, how do you calculate that? Well, you really don't. Uh, it's more of, of knowing what the plants need, what are they, how are they reacting, and I like to tell people that uh, God gave us a, 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 a water measurement gauge and that's called our index finger. Get those fingers in the ground and see what that moisture is. Uh, you know, if the plants are wilting and you put that index finger in there and it's moist, don't water. More water could actually drown the plants. So uh, check before you water, use that index finger and, and, and go for it. So uh, I often uh, advise gardeners to uh, think of watering less often than you are. Uh, I know it's hard to break habits. Uh, I, I'm in a family where habits are hard to break. Uh, my mom, she's 94 years old. I don't think I can get her out of the garden. She's out in the garden every, every morning at six o'clock during the summer, and she's got the water hose in her hand. She's watering every day. I can't change her, but we know what, what plants, um, how they react. If you water infrequently and in deep, what you, do, what you get, the end result is a root system that reaches deep into the soil, harvesting water and minerals from deeper versus a very shallow soil, a very shallow root system if you water daily. Uh, as well as you water daily, you, there's, there's a possibility of, of the plants getting um, root rot issues where you get the wilt down. Right now, tomatoes are just, just having a huge problem with, with a couple of wilt diseases. And it has to do with the uh, imbalance of watering. It's, a, it's consistently, but consistent to the point where it's not frequent. So, and then the, the other question we get about watering is how often or, or uh, what time of day should I water? Uh, it really doesn't matter other than I encourage not to water in the uh, late afternoon. Uh, you want your plants to go, go into the evening, uh, the leaves dry. Uh, the fungal organisms that can cause issues to fruit and, and uh, the foliage, uh, they are quite active at night and they're only active if there's soil, if there's moisture on the leaves. If the leaves are dry, less, less disease issues. So early morning watering, 
don't worry about watering the heat of the day. I hear people say, don't do that. Uh, it's going to burn the foliage. No, 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 it will not. That's an old wives tale. Um, the only concern about heat of the day watering is if you uh, have a mulch down that absorbs a lot of heat and you water over the top of that, you could uh, scorch some of the upper, upper uh, roots because the, the heat that's transferred to the water as it passes through the mulch. But that's such a, 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 a seldom issue. I, I don't really get excited about that. Next, drip, drip system. To be sure on, on frequency of watering and the amount of water, go with a drip system. They are, they are so easy to install. I know it's rather scary to, to folks who have never dealt with a drip system, and I really like the drip tape versus the soaker hoses. I know soaker hoses are very popular uh, and, and you might have that in your garden and you're very pleased with it and that's okay. Um, but those folks have, have used a drip system and this drip system is a very soft uh, tape. Uh, this is highly engineered. This engineer is out of uh, Israel. Uh, developed these uh, several years ago for commercial uh, production of vegetables in a, in a desert. Uh, but it is a fantastic, cheap, cheap stuff. You can uh, install these irrigation systems uh, by attaining them from various local uh, irrigation supply companies. You even see these kits at, uh, at um, supply stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, garden centers. I, I actually don't like using those because you, you actually end up with parts you don't need and then you don't, there's some parts you don't have. I like going to a local irrigation company. Uh, now I will say right now is not the time to go there because they are so inundated with everyone looking for irrigation supply. Uh, I like going to the local irrigation company in uh, the dead winter, you know, January, February, March timeframe, where they're, they have all the time in the world. They're so happy to see a customer walk in. They will give you hours of their time to educate you with what they have on the shelf that will work for your school garden. And they will sell you only the, the stuff that you need, not all that extra stuff or missing parts. One of the things you see in the picture is uh, underneath the roll on the left, that's actually a uh, inline filter. I know most of you will be using uh, city water, but city water can have junk in it, like, like uh, uh, sand particles. And you cannot have sand particles plug up your drip system. So it's almost a must to have a, a filter, rather, rather inexpensive uh, for what they are. Uh, also, that piece uh, has connected on there a pressure reducer. The, the water pressure that these uh, systems need are very low. The tap water pressure that coming out of, the, of a tap is much higher than it's needed. So you have to put a, put a pressure reducer, rather inexpensive little device that you, it is connected. It's on the right side of the, the filter right there. Um, those two devices are almost a must. Uh, I, I have both of those on my system, I use city water and, and it works perfect. Uh, gosh, there was one other thing I was gonna say about drip system it may come to me, but yes, mulches. Uh, this was addressed earlier using mulches. Uh, you, know, you can irrigate all you, you can, can and need, but if the soil warms up, plants are going to suffer. So if you have a buffer, that is from between the sun rays and the soil that kind of reduces the soil temperature and mulch is the key. Mulch not only reduces soil temperature, it main, maintains or retains soil moisture and reduces weeds. And what few weeds you get when you use mulches are really not anything uh, very uh, minimal and, and, and time consuming, it, it, it isn't. It is so, uh, I use, have used mulches in my garden, home garden for years. 
And I, it's, it's organic mulches, and the picture is showing uh, using ground up uh, uh, leaves that were collected in the, in the fall. Uh, I, I often use uh, ground up uh, uh, wood chips that a uh, tree service is looking to get rid of. I actually live next door to one and he dumps it on my place and I have this free mulch that turns into compost as well. Uh, and it's, it's just fantastic. There is a concern about using mulches and, and it tying up uh, some uh, fertility. Don't worry about it. Uh, it. Plants will overcome by you supplying additional fertility as needed. So how much uh, mulch should you put down? At least two to three inches of mulch. Uh, and I often get the question, well, once I'm finished gardening, do I need to rake it to the side? In my home garden, I don't. I incorporate it in the fall and let it uh, uh, um, mix with soil and do further decomposition during the winter months. And I, I've never really truly have, have had issues, but if you think you might, yes, pull it aside and then work your garden soil. Next. Next slide, please. There we go. Harvest, this was uh, talked about earlier, uh, but planting what to plant when. You know, we're right now uh, in, in uh, July, um, and you need to look at where you're at uh, in, in relation to when, when will you be getting your first frost. In northern Arkansas, it's going to be around uh, October 15th that you get your first frost. In southern Arkansas, it will be the last week of October. So you're very, you have a limited amount of time left to grow some warm season vegetables. Uh, so several plants, uh, the kind of the cutoff date in my mind has always been uh, July 4th weekend. That's the last weekend to, to look at as uh, planting some summer vegetables for the fall. But things that can be planted now that are perennial are your herbs. Plant your chives, oregano, thyme, and other perennial herbs that can tolerate the summer heat. But be careful the water. You can quickly overwater herbs, uh, but they're in the need of water uh, in this heat time. So maybe, maybe not right now planting herbs, maybe wait a little bit long, later into the, the uh, once we have a, a cooler period so that they are not uh, in the need of demand of water. Sweet potatoes, cutoff date for sweet potatoes. I planted my last slips July 1st. Southern Arkansas, you can probably, you know, Louisiana line, probably can plant uh, your late sweet potatoes, but you're a little too late. Cucumbers, yes, plant cucumbers still. Uh, I list the Armenian cucumber that can tolerate a lot of heat. It is is actually not a true cucumber, uh, but it, it grows like one. Uh, tastes similar to one, but it does look different, quite, quite unique. And I think the kids will have fun growing this. The next one listed is Malabar spinach. Uh, it's, it is not a true spinach, where spinach needs a cool season, uh, you know, the, the cooler temperature, uh, the Malabar spinach needs it hot. Uh, it's a vining plant. Uh, it is not, not all kids will enjoy it because um, you know, it's, it, to some, it will, it's pretty gross to eat it because it's, it's very slimy. Uh, some of the guys would say, well, it's like snot. <laughs> it's, it's pretty slimy. Uh, it has an interesting flavor. I enjoy eating it. Southern peas. Uh, there are some short season southern peas that you can still plant and, and get a, a fall crop out of them. But it's the short season ones, uh, those that require about 60 days versus those uh, true southern black eyed peas that they, they need uh, 70, 80, 90 days. So we're it's too late to plant those. But there, there are some short season southern peas. Truly a plant that uh, loves the heat is okra but too late to plant, but it could be planted a couple of three weeks ago and still get a fall crop out of them. Uh, but I'm listing plants here that can tolerate a lot of heat that would be successful in a summer garden. So maybe these are the things that you're looking at next spring. So if you have a summer garden, I mean, a school garden, you really don't want to plant anything. Uh, 
Sue mentioned uh, using uh, planting a, a cover crop in the summer instead of vegetables. Uh, and this is uh, always a great idea. The, you need to protect your soil. Your soil is, is a living organism full of uh, microbes that help your plants uh, pull nutrients from um, the soil. Uh, and, and having a good, healthy soil life uh, is, is essential for uh, good, uh, good vegetable production. Uh, so one, one of the ways to keep a soil healthy is to feed the soil microbes uh, and protect the soil microbes from the summer, summer heat by planting a cover crop. And in the picture shown, th this, uh, this is buckwheat. It is not a true wheat as you think of as, as a wheat. Uh, it is a summer uh, annual crop. Uh, it, it can go to uh, flower and seed rather quickly. As you see the kids hands uh, sticking up in the middle, it's not that tall. I think they're laying down actually. Uh, but uh, buckwheat makes a great cover crop. Uh, and, and actually you can, can uh, cut it down and use it as a mulch then. Once it starts flowering, cut it down, and it may be uh, laying on the top for three or four weeks before you uh, plant again. And that's certainly doable. And you're, you're protecting the soil microbes again by, by even just that. Next slide. Or you might decide that you know, you've had some, some uh, nutrition, not nutritional issues, uh, some soil borne disease issues uh in your soil uh and you want to might say bake your soil but the gardening term we use is we solarize your garden that is uh the method is you take clear plastic and stretch it over your your garden uh plot uh and you secure all edges but before you uh put the plastic down you need to make certain that the soil is moist it doesn't need to be sopping wet, but it needs to have soil moisture there. So cover it, secure it. You see that all the edges are, are, are secured. Uh, clear plastic will heat up uh, slower, but will hold heat longer than black plastic. So clear plastic is the, the material that we recommend to use. Uh, and the, the length of time is about six weeks uh, for keeping it covered. And what a wonderful time to do that in the summer. Um, and this will pretty much <coughs> <coughs> sterilize the top six inches or so of the soil uh, and rid of possible some soil borne organisms. Next slide. Uh, Blanca had uh, shared with you uh, that there's uh, 75 counties in Arkansas and there's a county agent just like her in every county in Arkansas. Now, well, not, I will say not everyone is as, as bright as, as Blanca is, but they have access to individuals like Blanca. We are a, a, a united systems where we do share things with each other. Uh, and then there's folks like me that support Blanca, uh, me being a state specialist and I, I serve all 75 counties in Arkansas. So she has access to, to me and, uh, and approximately 40 or 50 uh, of a specialist that provide uh, information statewide. And she also mentioned our website and this, I took a, a snapshot of our web page uh, earlier this week. Uh, and this is what we're showing. Uh, uh, you know, showcasing the common tomato problems because right now everyone's calling the offices about tomatoes. Uh, but this is our, our web page, the uada.edu webpage. Uh, great resource. A lot of the gardening information, if you look uh, kind of mid screen uh, uh, to the center there, there's yard and garden, and that's where you'll find there we are, that yard and garden. That's where you click, and it's not hot right now, but that's where you would click and, and uh, go. Next slide. So I appreciate the invitation. I've enjoyed this and uh, we'll uh, turn it over to Cecilia. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. We do have a couple in the chat and I see y'all are already engaging with one another, which is awesome. But our first question is when it is 100 degrees and high humidity, is watering every day better than every other day? Um, and I know we have some 
people saying they water every other day um, and don't on the weekend, but what is your best practice for that? The, the answer to that is it really depends on what your soil is. How much organic matter have you amended in in the past? Is it a sandy soil? Is it a clay soil? If it's a sandy soil, highly amended with organic matter, you might need to water every day. If you are have soil that's a heavier or clay, don't water every day. That's where you need to use your, your index finger and figure out, do the plants truly need it? Or are they just needing a little break from the sun like what all, all of us do? Uh, and quite often uh, in those heavy soils, that's the case where if you water every day, you'll actually cause more problems. Great, thank you. And then we had another question in the chat for you, Bernie, um, and it says, what do you do for root knot nematodes? Root knot nematodes, uh, fortunately, are seldom seen in our gardens uh, today. Uh, when I first started Extension a number of years ago, we were seeing them more often than we do today. And that's a good thing. Uh, so, in a garden plot that has root, not nematode, and if if you grow okra and tomatoes and some peppers, you will see root knot if you truly have root knot in place in the garden. So what do you do about it? Uh, you know, we've all heard the trick of using marigolds to, to plant next to things that have root knot nematode. Unfortunately, it truly doesn't work. Uh, the, the things that work is, uh, move away from that garden, uh, don't plant anything that's susceptible to root knot. Uh, you know, maybe plant corn there or squashes, uh, uh, you know, tomatoes and okra and peppers, they're your most susceptible to root knot. Um, or if that's not a possibility, uh, you're gonna have to sacrifice uh, the, the summer months and solarize your soil. And, and that will take care of the root knot. Great. Um, and then we have time for a few more questions. We have one for our extension agents here. Um, and it's, have you seen any examples of specialized school gardens using, utilizing elements of agroecology and agroforestry? And I guess that would be me. And I don't know, Bernie, if you know, but I don't. No, I have not seen any school gardens uh, uh, using uh, those concepts. Uh, certainly, uh, that's uh, something to delve into. Uh, uh, it, it is a uh, certainly an interest in the gardening community. Uh, so uh, my, my caution is uh, if you look into that and start something with your school garden and with these concepts, make sure that it's research based. Uh, what, what we see, you know, what I've seen in my career of 39 years at Extension Agent, I see so many fallacies out there. And the, these kind of develop from, from really true factual things. But if what happens is uh, some of the the detailed concepts of of, of starting these these new things, uh, some of the details are left out, and then we end up with something that truly doesn't work. But it it's it's become some somewhat of a fallacy, and people keep doing the wrong thing with it. So make sure you are really truly understanding it and and following those concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I wanted to add, Catherine said in the chat as well that they plant pollinator areas in their school garden and have integrated an orchard into green spaces for growth. Um, and these areas help provide habitat for beneficial insects and help with pest control. Um, and then I know we're a little short on time, but there was one last quick question that I wanted to get to so it wasn't left behind. And that was, you talked about tolerant vegetables on your page, Bernie. So what types of peppers can specifically be planted now? 
Uh, you know, I, what type of peppers? Not your long season peppers, you know, your habaneras, uh, but you wouldn't do that for a school garden anyway. Uh, for a school garden, you're going to be, do, be doing your, your sweet peppers, uh, the sweet bananas, the smaller bell type. Uh, but what, it, what is of interest possibly for, for a school garden is, is planting some of these ornamental peppers that are actually edible and in, in, uh, showing how to the kids how they could be used in, in making pepper sauces. And, and these ornamental peppers have become such a, a hit for fall gardens because they have such great fall color. They, they mature into to the yellows and the reds and oranges uh, and just adds another bonus element uh, depth to that, that school garden. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone for being here with us today on this webinar. We hope you learned something. I know I learned some stuff today. I was just talking today about the, the myth of whether or not um, leaves can burn up from watering them. So thanks for clearing that up, Bernie. Um, I just wanted to leave you all with a couple quick reminders about how to connect with Arkansas Farm to School. Um, first, of course, please go to our Arkansas Farm to School web website. Hopefully, Cecilia can throw that link to the ch into the chat for you all real quick, because we have tons of resources and handouts available there. Also, any webinars we've done um, are available um, there as well as recording, so you'll find this one there. Um, also, while you're there, look at the bottom page of any of, of uh, any page of the website, and you'll see a sign up for our newsletter. We put that out monthly. We're sharing all types of resources, anything new that we created for the Department of Ag, but also we love to share out what's going on across the state and nationally to support farm to school, including um, upcoming grant announcements and things like that. So that's a really another great way to stay connected. Um, lastly, our social media, Arkansas Farm to School on Facebook. Um, you can find, we share similar resources there as our newsletter, but also if you're a school garden and you have a school garden page or even just your regular schools page where you're sharing updates about your school garden, please um, tag us at Arkansas Farm to School because we love to share out what you all are doing in your gardens so that um, we can really lift up and inspire other gardens across the state by seeing what's going on in school gardens in their own state. Um, lastly, if you have any um, additional follow-up questions related to starting a school garden, supporting it in the summer, Cecilia is your girl. She is our state local, um, sorry, excuse me, state school garden manager. So I've included her email and her phone number here on this slide as a resource, but we'll also be following up with a follow-up email um, following this presentation with the um, recording for the webinar, some slides, and then contact information for all of our wonderful speakers today. I want to thank um, Bernie, Jennifer, and Blanca all for being here and sharing this really great information with everyone today. Um, and thank you all um, as participants for being here. We really appreciate you. And that's all we have for you. <laughs>